And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Jamie Stover, CDT, is the Senior Manager of Dental Lab Applications at Carbon. Jamie has been a dental laboratory technician for over 23 years and has extensive experience on all aspects of transitioning workflow from analog processes to digital, both clinically and in lab. Um, he's written dozens of articles for publication in domestic and international dental trade journals and lectures regularly on a myriad of topics for dental professionals. In his role at Carbon, Jamie is a consultant for labs and dentists on streamlining, streamlining production with the digital workflow and implementing strategies for business growth, development, and utilization of new applications and was awarded the NADL Merit Award for Outstanding Achievement in 2021. Congrats, Jamie. <laughs> and then he's also a member of the Dental Technician Alliance of the American College of Prosthodontists, is co-chair of the NADL Business Management Committee, and is the fiscal officer on the National Board for Certification for Dental Lab Technicians. He sounds like he has a lot of free time on his hands. <laughs> um, and then we have Jay joining Jamie later. Um, Jay Collins is the CEO of the Dental Labs, including Cornerstone, Amsterdam, Broadway, and Collins Dental Labs, and has given dentists the opportunity to have options. Being in the business for over 12 years and taking technology, expert technicians, and surrounding the lab with a great operations team, he has built a company that works as a partner in every restoration. If there is someone saying, no, we can't do that, Jay has the mindset of saying, let me see how we can accomplish this together. I like it. So now I'll turn the time over to you guys. Thank you so much, Sharon. Hello, everybody. Super happy to be here. Thank you very much to uh, CE Zoom and also to the Dental Lab. Uh, this is this is really fun. Um, you know, I, Jay and I, I think we have a lot in common, you know, being lab technicians. And um, I'll, I'll kind of add on to what Jay, you know, I like Jay's quote there. If somebody says no, I say, let's see how we can get it done. I used to tell my, my, uh, my team something similar. I would say, you know, if a dentist is on the phone and they're asking us if we can do something, just, you know, unless it's, you know, dangerous for the patient or <laughs> somehow unethical, if it's a digital workflow and they're asking, can we do this? Say yes, hang up the phone and then let's put our heads together and figure it out. So Jay, kudos to you and your team. That's awesome. Um, we're here tonight to talk about something really exciting. Um, we're here tonight to talk about uh, 3D printed night guards. And this is something that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, this product has been around for a few years now, and I've worked with uh, lots and lots of labs and clinicians uh, to help them with this application. So I'm here tonight to tell you um, all about it and compare and contrast the difference between traditional night guard fabrication and uh, 3D printed, all the benefits for patients and clinicians, and uh, also to talk about 3D printing a little bit and give you an idea of what's happening with 3D printing in the dental lab space. So here we go. You know, we really can't talk about much at all in our world today, um, especially in our industry without you know, first kind of agreeing that this is pretty much where we're at right now. I don't, I don't know that Elon was the one to say this first. I, I did hear him say this, so I credit him. Could have been on the uh, the pod, the Joe Rogan podcast if you saw that one. He's been on a couple times. Uh, one of them, he got himself into some hot water. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I do really agree with this, and we know this is true, right? When we put our phones on the nightstand at night and we, uh, you know, wake up in the morning, a lot of times there's been an automatic update to the iOS, to the operating uh, systems and software. And now maybe our texts function a little bit different or we have some different emojis or something, right? And we just take for granted that our world changes that fast. And in, in our clinics and in our labs, it is really changing fast. And, you know, another thing we take for granted is the fact that the fixed side of the industry, that is, you know, crowns, bridges, you know, uh, we, we just watched an awesome video of, you know, a Presta Zirconia crown being fabricated. I was starting to twitch a little bit because I spent a lot of time myself at the bench doing those. And I, I think I want to go to to Jay's lab and actually, you know, start staining and glazing some anterior zirconia crowns and stuff. It's really fun. And the fact of the matter is that what you see on the left hand side of your screen, we transitioned away from these analog processes of, you know, waxing and casting and opaquing and stacking porcelain uh, over a decade ago. And now over 80% of the restorations that are prescribed every day in this country are either full zirconia or zirconia based. So we transitioned from analog processes to a very digital process, which was milling zirconia. And also like you saw, um, you know, designing uh, 
under structures and wax printing them and casting them. And we've integrated digital into the fixed um, you know, side of the, work, of the workflow a long, long time ago. What's very new and pretty recent, and if you look at the overall history and time that our industry has been around is digital removables, right? Dentures and splints. And that side of the industry now is transitioning very, very quickly to removable workflow. And it's bringing with it a ton of benefits at a really, really important time in our industry. So really what we're talking about is when we move processes and products from the analog bench to the digital workflow, we're really moving people and people are the ones that are making that change, just like technicians like myself, my CDTs and Crown and Bridge. So just like us fixed technicians over a decade ago have transitioned to the digital uh, realm, removable technicians are now doing that much, much quicker because of hardware, software, material advancements. But we're still at an interesting intersection in this industry today, right? We're, we're, we're at this intersection where the art and the hand craftsmanship that's still so important you saw Again, I'll reference that opening video that we saw tonight of, you know, a technician, you know, doing some of these processes, staining and glazing these crowns. Everything a dental lab does is a bespoke product. It only fits in one patient's mouth one way, right? It's a one-off custom piece. Dental labs have to do that consistently. They have to do it reliably. They have to do it at scale. And that's where the technology and the material science is really coming in to help bring some real production efficiencies, both clinically and in the lab. And then there's the business strategy piece too, right? They have to run their labs like businesses and they have to be able to help their, clini their, their clinicians run their clinics like businesses. And you know, an example of that is what we're doing here tonight, this amazing opportunity to come together and learn. And that's, a, that's an awesome business strategy side. So that's where we're at in the industry today. Where are we at with Bruxing and Night Guard needs? What well, this is a, a study from our friends at Keystone. Keystone actually makes the the material that we're talking about tonight, this key splint clear material for these printed splints. And we know Bruxing's been around for a while, but how many of you have seen these, uh, this kind of data? Some of you may have even participated in this, this survey. I keep looking for an updated survey. This is the, late, uh, the latest one I can find, which is just, just about a year ago. But what we're seeing is a drastic increase for the need of splints, right? 71% of clinicians now report that they see an increase and teeth grinding and clenching. And you can see the rest of them, 63% increase in chip teeth, cracked teeth, and TMD, TMJ symptoms on the rise. You know, does anybody have a reason to be stressed out today? <laughs> can anybody think of a reason why more people are grinding their teeth at night during the day? You know, it used to be that a certain demographic really just wasn't impacted by, by this, uh, this, I guess, this behavior or this trend. And now, younger uh, younger patients and patients who typically would not experience this kind of damage dentition from grinding really are. So there's never been a, a higher need or more need for these than in the, uh, in the world today. But on the dental lab side of the industry, I always like to take a look at some of our trends. And so if we have an increasing need for these appliances, and then on the dental lab side, what we see is an aging workforce of removable experienced technicians and actually a pretty staggering shortage of removable technicians. Um, latest NADL survey here on this trend shows that over 60% of techs are close to retirement age and only about one quarter of them are lifted, listed as most experienced denture techs versus least experienced. Why? We don't have a lot of the dental lab trade schools, the technical trade schools that we used to. There's only a handful left in the country. We don't, so we don't have a, a, a new uh, crop or you know, group of dental, removable dental lab technicians entering the workforce, and um, you know, we so we just we have an, an aging population of technicians, and then also you may or may not know that a lot of times in dental labs we hire relatively inexperienced uh, folks to to work in our labs a lot of times, and we train them up, right? Because we don't have this abundance of technicians you know, CDTs and new technicians leaving tons of dental lab trade programs and wanting, you know, banging on our doors, wanting to come to work at our labs. We've had to resort over the last, you know, probably decade of bringing folks into the lab and then maybe, maybe you start them in the delivery car, in the model room, and then they, they're ambitious and they show up to work every day and they, they want to, you know, move into a career, then you can move those people into different positions in the lab. And that's, that's what I love so much about this industry is that's kind of how I got started in the lab a long, long, long time ago. And 
But the issue is now because of staffing shortages in all industries, we're really competing for those entry level positions, right? Those entry level technicians. The the uh, bottom right hand picture you see here, I live in the Seattle area in Washington state. That's on the east side of Seattle. Um, that sign now says $17.50 an hour and a thousand dollar signing bonus. So I took that picture probably two months ago and now they've increased it. So we're really, uh, you know, at an impasse here where we, we're, we're lacking experienced removal technicians and now we're, we're, we're struggling for the ability to actually train them ourselves. And so technology comes in and really helps us uh, move that knowledge that those experienced removal technicians have, capture it and move it into the digital realm and then bring in uh, some folks, uh, other folks that don't have maybe any dental experience, let alone dental lab experience and help to share that knowledge. And they can actually uh, do some steps that I'm going to show you in a little bit of production that don't require uh, really any dental knowledge. So let's kind of sync and calibrate here on how night guards are made. This is the four main ways that the night guards are really fabricated today. If a, if a dentist sends a prescription out to the universe, uh, you know, and it's received by a lab, there's different production methods, right? But most of the night guards that are fabricated today are still analog. They're the traditional uh, method with wax, super labor intensive to produce. Um, and because of all the analog steps, fit can vary wildly. Thermoform night guards, they are nice in a way because they do eliminate some of the hands-on production steps. So labs can produce them a little bit quicker with less skilled labor, uh, but they're not always a direct comparison in abrasion resistance and strength and durability to an acrylic night guard. They're, I kind of think of them as like a really heavy duty uh, bleach tray or, or, or a heavy duty aligner or something like that, right? They're not quite as robust as some of these other night guards. If you want to go digital, you can mill night guards. A lot of times in our industry, almost all the times actually in our industry and in a lot of industries, when a production process will move from analog to digital, it will start with milling. And although that is a digital production process, milling is inherently a very wasteful process because you're starting with a large mass of material. You're cutting out just the pieces you need. The rest is usually thrown away. Maybe a percentage of it can be recycled. And it's also when we're talking specifically about milling acrylic, now, milling zirconia is a different story. Milling zirconia is pretty darn efficient. And there's a reason why, because you can spin the burrs very fast and cut that zirconia very quickly because it is a, it's a hard material. Even in the green state, before you center it, it's a pretty robust material. But when you go to cut an acrylic in a mill, you have to slow that spindle speed way down. Otherwise, the burr will spin so fast that when it cuts the night guard out, it will actually melt the acrylic and, and, and melt it. So uh, what that means is that the two night guards that you see milled here on the screen in this puck of acrylic can take anywhere from an hour to almost two hours to mill just these, these two night guards. In comparison, the 3D printed night guards, you're not starting with a large mass of material and cutting out just what you need and wasting the rest. Uh, I'll show you the workflow in a little bit, but you basically start with a pool of resin and you print the night guards from this pool of resin. The rest of the resin can be poured back through a filter into the bottle and reused. And you, there's very little waste. Just the support structure is really all that is that is wasted. And for production efficiency, you can do eight or 10 or even more of these night guards uh, in about 90 minutes. So in less than less time than it takes to mill the two night guards you see on the screen, uh, the two that you see on the screen, you can print five times that number or more. So drastically efficient workflow. What about some of the benefits? And these are really a lot of the benefits that we see when we're talking about moving to this, this printed night guard. The nice thing for clinicians to know is that you can continue to take impressions and bites as you do, meaning you don't need to have an intraoral scanner to access a digital night guard from, uh, from the, the dental lab here. So what you can do is continue to take a traditional impression, traditional bite records. The lab will then um, convert that to uh, digital digital files and they'll take that into their design software and I'll show you uh, what that looks like in a little bit. Um, or if you have an intraoral scanner, you can send your intraoral scans and, and you know, scan the arches and the bite just like you normally would and send that to the lab and, and the lab will, will use that data. So you don't have to change what you're doing, which is great. Uh, super strong and abrasion resistant. I'm gonna show you a study in just a minute, uh, comparison. Uh, better fit, we're removing a lot of those analog steps. And when we have those steps, we introduce uh, a lot of room for error and, and there's lots of different inefficiencies that can creep in there. And we just, a lot of times don't have great fit when we have analog night guards 
the digital path is much more pure. Um, again, mitigating the shortage of those removable technicians. We, we talked about that a minute ago. The digital record is huge. So a lot of times how night guards meet their demise is dogs eat them, right? Dogs eat them. Maybe they get left wrapped in a napkin and thrown away, or they just fall under the nightstand or in a weird spot behind the bed where all the cobwebs are and nobody ever cleans there. So it's gone, right? It might as well be gone. So it's funny to kind of joke about how night guards meet their demise, but what's not funny is any time a clinician has to get a patient back into a chair and start over, right? It's not funny for the patient and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's expensive, quite frankly, for clinicians. Chair time now more than ever is expensive. So with this process, this digital file is stored. And if the dog eats the night guard, you simply call the dental lab. They pull up their design file for you. They throw it in the next uh, print batch, print it, polish it up and send it to you. So within a, a day or two uh, after of the patient calling you and saying their dog ate the night guard without even another appointment, a new night guard just shows up at the office. So really, really impactful there. Um, labs can uh, can report a labor savings. Uh, they can they can you know have some labor savings that can be passed on to uh, clinicians, which is really nice for for everybody. And uh, you know if you're thinking, man, this is I haven't tried one of these. This sounds pretty good, but you know I don't want to be a guinea pig for new technology. Well, guess what? We're way on the other side of the guinea pig curve with this. We've been out you know over three years worldwide with this. And there's, according to Keystone's estimates, over 2 million of the key splint, um, of their soft splint material um, in the mouth uh, to date. So way on the other side of, of guinea pig range at this point. Here is a comparison, a really great slide, uh, strength comparison. So Keystone, if you know anything about that company, they, they you know, they're really big into data and backing up products that they put out on the market. And they do a really good job. And important to note here that if you look at the number of test cycles on the right hand side of this chart, these key splint hard and key splint soft products were tested at double the number of test cycles as the majority of these other um, brands of acrylic for traditional acrylics. And some of these are actually, um, you know, you have some traditional acrylics here and some thermoform acrylics here. And you can see that they have similar or a lot of times less uh, volume loss and meaning more abrasion resistance than, than their competitors, than these other products at double the number of test cycles. So again, you know, putting myself in the mind of the clinician, I'd want to know, Hey, does anything have to change for me? No. Is this safe and better for the patient? Absolutely. Right. This is, we can see that this is a, a strong product that it's, it's trusted. It's been around for a while. And so we're not sacrificing anything for strength just to pick up some efficiency and maybe a better fit. So pretty cool. Speaking about dogs eating night guards, this happens to be my dog. He's a golden retriever, as you can see there. Anybody have a golden retriever? I can't see the chat box right now, but you know, shout out, uh, shout out chat if you have a golden retriever. They're great, right? Super good family dogs. Um, he's a very handsome dog. He's not the most intelligent, I don't think, of, of some dogs that I've come across in my life. But the thing is that this dog eats anything from the time he was a puppy, he would eat, you leave it laying on the floor, he would eat it. And most of this stuff hasn't caused too many issues other than maybe some, you know, a couple of days of GI issues and we won't get into that. And then, you know, it resolves itself. Okay. There was this one time where this dog, his name's Omac, he uh, ate one of my socks and the sock went in lengthwise into his small intestine. It just stretched out perfectly as he swallowed it. It was like a $2,500 surgery. It was two weeks of waking up three times a night and giving him pills. And oh my God. So I was like, you know, I, I, I in, have implemented a lot of precautions to not this dog eat anything anymore, but I did want to see what would happen if I offered him one of my key splint night guard samples. I want you to see, this was very interesting. Watch this. What do you think? Do you think he wanted it? Do you think he would have eaten it? I would like to be able to go to Keystone and say, I have proven uh, even another benefit of your night guards that dogs will not eat them. And wouldn't that be amazing, right? Oh my God. Think of how many millions they would sell if these were dog resistant. I hesitated doing that though, because I think he would have swallowed that thing whole if I would have just let it go out of my finger. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Some very scientific data on if dogs like these or not. Let's take a look at traditional night guard fabrication. If you haven't been to the lab for a while, 
I want you to see what happens when you prescribe a traditional acrylic night guard. It starts with wax, right? Well, it actually starts with either printing a model and duplicating that printed model or pouring a model from a traditional traditional impression and then duplicating that. So either way, you gotta start with a couple models, you gotta wax it up, get it as dialed in occlusion wise and thickness wise as you can. You take that wax up and you invest it in a flask. Once that stone sets up, you put that in a boil out unit. It's gonna melt out the wax. You're gonna put some acrylic in there. You're gonna process the acrylic. And then once that acrylic cures, you're gonna break the flask open as you see here. And there is your night guard. And now the fun begins. We get to destroy the first model that we created uh, with this air chisel to get the night guard separated. And then we're, we're going to take this night guard and we're going to put it back on the duplicated model. And we're going to start, guess what? We're going to start grinding on it because as dental lab technicians, guess what we love to do? We, you give us a handpiece, we love to grind, right? We don't, but we have to, because no matter how good of a waxer you are, it's not uniform thickness. No matter how good of a waxer you are, the bite is going to need some adjustment because there's been expansion, expansion possibly of the model stone, expansion of the acrylic during the curing process. It is not a super accurate, it's just not a super accurate process. I have a lot of friends. I don't know why I have so many engineer friends. It just worked out that way. I have quite a few engineer friends and they'll tell me that, Jamie, what you're describing is called copy error. And it's, it's anytime you have a lot of steps in a process, the further and further you get away from that original uh, impression, the more room for copy area to creep in from the things I mentioned from expansion of stone, you know, wax thickness, expansion of acrylic, right? So if we can remove the amount of copy error in the digital process, which we do, we can get a much better fitting uh, night guard. Let me show you uh, to compare and contrast what, what a key splint night guard looks like uh, as far as fabrication compared to what you just saw. Check this out. Every time I see that video, I just, I get this visual in my mind, like of driving around in an old 1950, like flatbed Chevy farm truck, and then parking it and jumping into like a brand new Tesla. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of the comparison of the technologies because the lost wax technique, the wax and then boil out and then process acrylic technique. I mean, we're talking about decades and decades and decades old technology versus something that is relatively very new, right? So I want to chat a little bit about the production. Why don't I talk about 3D printing here in general, because there's a lot of interesting things happening in the world as far as production goes with 3D printers, not just in our industry, but in some others. I'm going to touch on that for you. But we hear a lot about 3D printers and we hear... Uh, you know, maybe we'll hear that, oh, I heard in Europe a bridge was 3D printed, or we, we know that our kids can go to a hobby shop and buy a pretty inexpensive 3D printer and then scan things with an app on their phone and 
print toys in their room, right? But how does it work? It's kind of like mystical. Well, let's break it down really quickly. This chart is interesting. This covers a lot of the different um, types of, of 3D printers where we're really focused mostly in the dental industry and specifically in the dental lab industry is the DLP, digital light projection and digital light synthesis uh, printers. That's the majority of the printers that are in use in dental labs today and even in clinics today for the chair side printers. So we're gonna talk about how DLP technology works just briefly and then compare and contrast that with the DLS technology of these carbon printers that the dental lab has that they're using to produce these key splint soft clear, which are exclusively um, right now fabricated in a partnership with Keystone and Carbon. So how DLP printers work in a nutshell is you have a piece of glass and that piece of glass forms your, your vat that holds the liquid basically for the resin that you dispense, right? And the resin is gonna become the part that you print. So underneath that piece of glass, you have a light source, typically a UV light. And then you have a build platform that lowers into your, your liquid. And what happens next is really where the magic is. The part is designed in the design software, the CAD part of the process. The CAM part is the software that takes that part and it, it slices it into a bunch of slices, right? A bunch of layers. And then those layers are played in succession via the UV light on the underside of the glass. And as that light shines through the glass, it partially cures the resin on the, on the top side of the glass. Then the build platform will pull that partially cured resin off the glass, allowing new resin to flow underneath. And then the light will play the next slice of the part. It will partially cure to the glass. The uh, build, <laughs> the build plate will, will, will pull up and, and so on and so on. So you're basically just repeating this process and you're kind of getting a layer by layer wafer cookie approach. And 3D printing, took a long time to kind of get wings and really take off in the dental lab industry because uh, largely of the software and the materials that were available and also because that was kind of a slow process, right? And when the the, the folks who that co-founded my company, uh, Carbon, what they realized is, hey, we know that the UV light will partially cure this, this resin, but we also know that oxygen will inhibit the curing of resin to the glass. So they developed a very special piece of glass. It's actually two special pieces of glass that are oxygen permeable. And by pumping oxygen up through that glass, you create a layer, a very, very thin layer right on the top side of the glass where resin cannot partially cure to that glass. Meaning you can remove, you can pull the build platform up and play the parts quicker. As you're pulling the part up, new resin is continuously flowing uh, underneath. It was originally called clip or continuous liquid interface printing because um, you were just able to to move much quicker so it allowed us to go quicker it allowed us to produce parts that are um, smoother and have different material characteristics and it also allowed us to to print parts that typically were pretty tough to print on 3d printers because of the types of supports that you need this is a very close up under magnification here of um, an actual part being printed and we're going to be able to see um, the, the dead zone, which create, which is uh, exists right at the surface of the glass. And as you can see in red, that represents the part being printed. And you can see the resin flowing underneath this part as it's being printed. And we're not doing this, you know, print, pull up, stop, print, pull up, stop. It is just truly a, a, a seamless process. And what happens is it produces parts that have different mechanical properties. And you can see with traditional DLP, you have this layer by layer kind of built horizontal build profile, right? And how you orient the part in the build, it'll affect the strength. And with the DLS technology uh, that the dental lab is using to produce these, these night guards, you can see that orienting the part different ways doesn't affect the strength. And also we don't have a horizontal uh, build profile, right? We have almost a 45 degree build profile. It's a much tighter grain structure and it produces parts that uh, are quite frankly, very strong and very smooth. It also allows us to produce some very unique geometries. Lattice is one of those. Lattice is a very interesting geometry. It's, it can be tuned. It's all these individual thousands of individual struts. And you can see that you can make some of the struts shorter, longer, thicker, skinnier, you know, however you want to do it to produce the type of fit and effect that you want to. So where Lattice is really coming into 
uh, consume, the consumer world is anywhere where we typically use foam for insulation or for protection. So we think about shoes, helmets, gloves, things like that. Lattice produces a much, much uh, better protection. So if we kind of zoom out of the dental lab world for a minute and the dental industry, and we go into other, other industries, companies like Adidas are using the same exact printer that the dental lab is, this carbon printer to produce the, the lattice midsoles that you see there on their Adidas 40 forward shoes. And this is the first shoe in history that's been shown to actually propel the runner forward. Now I have to tell you, I'm not really a runner. I run out of necessity, uh, basically when I'm on somewhere where I don't have my bike because I, I really like to ride bikes. Um, and I didn't feel like it was pushing me like 15 miles an hour faster or anything like that, but they are incredible to run in. And I take that from somebody who doesn't love running. I, I do enjoy running in these shoes. You can actually scan a runner's foot. And if you wanted to, you could take that uh, foot scan into software and you could print a, a custom uh, midsole that's tuned to that runner's, that runner's body and that runner's arch form. Um, companies like Rydell and CCM um, are making football helmets and hockey helmets that are offering much better protection because instead of just kind of a small, medium, large, what size head do you have? Here's a helmet with foam in it. Um, they're actually producing custom uh, pieces of this lattice that fit the player's head intimately only one way. And they're basically putting a reflective hood on the player, scanning their head, taking that into software and then designing these helmets, which offer much better protection, much lighter weight, more breathable, um, companies like specialized in, in physique are producing bike seats, bike saddles that have uh, really improved comfort and uh, are actually kind of been proven to, to re reduce some pressure points and actually be healthier over time to ride because of this lattice structure. So there's a scanning process for runners and there's a scanning process for football and hockey players for helmets. There actually is a scanning process for cyclists. I, I'm a cyclist. I haven't had that done. Um, there actually is also an off the shelf version of this as well that you can get. So if you're a cyclist, check into this, ask your bike shop. Problem is they can't keep them in stock, but ask them about this. There's two different versions now, super, super, um, a huge improvement. Also in the automotive industry, companies like Ford and Lamborghini are using 3d printers to put uh, parts on production vehicles. Do you know that something like 90% of the warranty claims on newer cars are caused by electrical issues, electrical connection failures, things like that. And how those parts are, are largely produced is injection molding. And injection mold is an amazing thing. It's a it's like a $250,000, $300,000 machine basically with moving parts and pieces inside. And the, the issue is that when these parts are produced on these injection molds, if you wanna make a change or iterate to a new version, you have to retool the mold or, or, or basically make a new mold. They also have a finite lifetime where they're wet, wear out and have to be replaced. And what these companies are finding that they can produce electrical connectors and especially when they, when they want to make an iteration like model year, like mid year of a model run or something where they need, they find out that they have an issue and they need to fix it. You can easily just go into the software, make a couple of tweaks to the design. And a couple hours later, you can have a part in your hand that you can experiment with. And you just cannot do that with injection molding. So 3D printing is really disrupting manufacturing and pay, pay big attention, pay a lot of attention to it in the next year or so and watch what happens worldwide with 3D printing. Where I'm really excited though, is in the medical space. So there's companies like Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, others, these companies have become household names uh, for, for obvious reasons over the last couple of years. And they're working on ways to 3D print uh, medical devices and actual parts, uh, you know, surgical parts for, for uh, patients that have some pretty impactful benefits. There are bioabsorbable resins being, being fabricated and in, 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 uh, in testing where you can 3d print a part that doesn't stay solid forever. It will dissolve and, and break down and pass through the body without a trace. So some of these applications could be like a heart stent that you could, um, you know, design in CAD software. You could print a heart stent. You could surgically, uh, put it in a patient's artery. Once the artery heals around it, it can design, it can dissolve and pass through the body without a trace and not have to stay in there. Also, if you've heard anything about microneedles, who, if you haven't heard about microneedles, I strongly suggest just go Google microneedles and, and, and check that whole uh, field out. But basically what it is, is you could do a microneedle. The experimentation is showing, you know, either with a dissolvable 
a dissolvable tip out of one of these bioabsorbable resins like we talked about, or you can simply coat the micro needle with a medication like a vaccine. And this is what you're looking at here is an actual 3D printed little patch of micro needles that researchers at uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill are testing vaccinations with. So some of the benefits that they're discovering is, here's a few. Number one, they're discovering that if you go, if you inject a vaccine just under the surface of the dermis, there's a much higher immune response. It elicits a much higher immune response than if you jab a needle into fatty tissue and go deeper. They've taken it a step further and said, you know what? In the mucosa, if you inject, use micro needles to do a vaccine in the mucosa, you get even a higher immune response than just under the dermis, which is really interesting. You think about what it takes to vaccinate. We just, what we've been through in the last couple of years, we've seen vaccinations at large scale and it's kind of daunting. You have to have trained professionals giving shots, but you could imagine the possibility of, you know, a future time when uh, if you're vaccinating with a micro needle that we could just self vaccinate ourselves, right. Just by, you know, doing, doing this, right. Or maybe in the mouth, whatever, you know, whatever the instruction would happen to be. So, so 3d printing these is really the preferred method right now. And it's, it's the only way that you could really do it at scale and produce these very quickly. So anyway, I like to, like I said, I like to look at other industries and it's really, it's really neat to look at the things that we're doing in our industry and then pick our heads up and look over the fence and go, okay, well, wow, what are they doing over here in this industry? And how is it impacting our lives? And more importantly, how will additive manufacturing continue to impact our lives? It's pretty impressive. NASA is even using carbon 3D printed parts on uh, their little robotic explorer. So everywhere from the bench at dental labs up into space, these 3D printed parts are in use today. What about some other applications? I know we're talking about night guards and we're going to get back to that, but you know, the dental lab is using the 3D printers to produce lots of the, the applications that you see on the screen here today, right? From highly accurate models, especially for implants, um, surgical guides, castable parts, you know, different types of 3D printed dentures, there's orthodontic applications, and even, you know, soft tissue, there's, there's 3D printable soft tissue now for uh, gingiva masks. So lots and lots of ways that 3D printers are being used in our industry. Let's take a look, look about the workflow here. And then we're going to move on to the Q&A. So again, I'm not monitoring the chat or the Q&A yet. Um, hopefully you guys, if you have some good questions cooking up, we're going to be happy to answer those for you here in a couple minutes. But um, again, so the important thing to note is that either whether you take a traditional impression or you have an intraoral scanner, doesn't matter. We can still produce these night cards for you. Um, the lab is going to take the uh, traditional impression. They're either going to pour a model and they're going to scan that model and the opposing and the bite. Sometimes they can just scan the impression in the bite. Uh, or if you have an intraoral scanner, they're going to import your intraoral scan data into their design software, which looks like this. If you haven't seen what some of this design software looks like for removables, it's pretty impressive. Virtual articulators to where you can have an articulator library and you can mount the models virtually on these articulators, just like you could at the bench. You could run them through all the excursions, protrusive, retrusive, everything that you can do at the bench to simulate uh, the, the movement of the jaw. You're not limited to just a flat plane occlusion. You can do a ramped occlusion or a flat plane occlusion. So it's not like you're just limited to one style of night guard design. These technicians uh, have all the tools and the software that they do at the bench and can produce a, a, a pretty amazing fitting night guard. So they'll design it in the in the CAD software and then they'll export that to the, the CAM software of the printer. This is a screenshot of our actual CAM software. You're seeing the build plate of a, a Carbon M2 printer. And you can see here, there's a lot of data that shows up. Number one, you can see how these are nested to the build platform. You can see the print time is an estimate about an hour and 40 minutes to print 10 night guards. And you can see the resin volume required. And so the lab knows exactly how much resin to dispense into our, into our, our cassette or our build, our build area. And then uh, a lot of that resin can be reclaimed and, and, and poured back into the, the bottle and reused. And the purple area that you see here, the mesh area, is what we call the fencing or the support areas. And that allows the lab to, to nest or to arrange these night guards on the build platform at a 40 degree angle, which means that printing across the arch, you're gonna have a lot of accuracy. 
and the whole part is supported because there are suction uh, forces during the, the print process. There's, there's suction forces on the parts and these, these, these arch supports uh, allow us to print these without warping them or distorting them. So by the time we get them all polished up and to the patient, they fit really, really well. That's a great shot there on the left of the cassette and that special piece of glass, oxygen permeable glass we talked about earlier. So you can see here, this technician is dispensing the resin into the, the cassette. The night guards will be printed. After they're printed, we're gonna take a little spatula. We're gonna remove those from the build platform. We're then gonna remove the support structure, which you see on the left there. And it's, it's interesting because Although this support structure is, is it's robust and it, it really serves its purpose during the printing, it they're, the way that they're attached to the night guards is basically just a bunch of individual little spots. And so it's almost like a zipper. Uh, it feels like removing, uh, like tearing an envelope when you go to remove these from the night guard. So it's not a process where you're, you know, reefing on these things to, to, get, to get the support structure off. It's a very quick process where the lab will remove the support structure. They then put the night guards in isopropyl alcohol and they, they clean them. They do, it's a shaker table. Like you can see here, it kind of swirls the, the isopropyl alcohol around. Um, they'll then take a swab and they'll swab out the intaglio because you want to make sure you get all the, the uh, uncured resin out of the inside of, of the night guard. Uh, they'll do one more two minute wash in isopropyl alcohol. They'll let them air dry for about 30 minutes and then they go into the UV cure unit and they do their, they receive their final cure. So before they're in this, this final cure, they're, they're partially cured. And then after they come out of this, this final UV cure, they're fully cured. You can, uh, you know, they're good to go in the patient's mouth. They're good to handle without gloves. They're, 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 uh, they're all ready to go. So that, that's all the, those are all the steps that are involved really in, in producing these. And then they polish them up and, Really, polishing isn't too much different than polishing a traditional acrylic night guard. Uh, the company Keystone, they, they have produced a polishing guide, which is available for the lab to, to uh, share with you. It's a PDF form. They, they have some recommended burrs and some recommended uh, you know, appliances that they, that they found work really well. You can do chair side adjustments and polish them up if you need to. Um, you, know, you could use everything that you're traditionally using now, chair side, to, to do some adjustments and polishing. You can use, I guess, the important thing here is to know to check every box uh, on along the scale of like what changes and what is very similar. So again, putting myself, you know, in the, in the shoes of a clinician, I'd want to know, well, do I have to buy this kit that then becomes a consumable and I can only use this type of burr to polish this night guard or something and no, that's not the case. You can, you can definitely use uh, whatever, you know, you've been using to adjust and to polish these up for, for chair side adjustments, which there are much, much fewer, much fewer of than traditional night guards. So we're going to get to the Q&A session here pretty quick. And I just want to um, really quickly bring it back to where we started talking about the evolution of our industry, right? And the evolution of our world through technology. And I really love looking back at, you know, people who have done some impactful things with production and, and helped to kind of move our world and evolve our world. And Henry Ford was definitely one of those folks. I think that's pretty undisputable. And, you know, I love this quote when he was, you know, speaking about change and speaking about, you know, making changing processes, right? And it's as human beings, we don't like to change, right? It's it, and and sometimes for good reason. And change management is a lot of what dental labs are doing today: change management with their technicians and change management with their clinicians and, and back and forth. But I love this. You know that if we continue to do what we've done, we're going to continue to get the same results. And so it's it's really important to realize that hey the hardware, the software, and the materials for additive manufacturing are evolving at a very, very rapid pace. And they've come a long way, even in the last you know, year, especially in the last five years to where now they're really challenging and rivaling milling as the preferred production method for many applications in our lab and disrupting lots of other manufacturing processes and in other industries, as you can see. So um, pretty fun. Oh, uh, geez, if you haven't seen the evolution of a dental lab technician, you're going to want to see this. So this is our first day in the lab. This is about 15 years in, and this is about 30 years in the lab. Now, I, I have a theory also that I think through these digital production processes, we can actually start to re reduce the effects 
of stress in the lab and reduce this, this kind of an evolution, I think we can start to turn the clock back, but we're going to have to wait and see maybe a couple more years. I can start to have a different kind of evolutionary path. I just like to pick on dental lab techs. I've been one for a long time. Hey, if we we're all together and we're all in the same room every once in a while, when I'm speaking to clinicians in person, sometimes that will say evolution of a dentist, you know, but I, I wouldn't dare do that this evening because I can't walk off the stage and, you know, some it's, you, you can't put me in a headlock and, you know, get back at me. So I feel like it would be unfair to pick on clinicians too much tonight. So I'll just pick on us. Anyway, um, here's some references for you. This is a lot of the data that was given tonight. Um, if you need to or want to um, screenshot this, um, a lot of these facts and figures, this is where I found them. And 